Welcome loves to another day of Today Explained. Today is Tuesday the 11th and we started by finishing up that viral graphic organizer. So if y'all would grab out your viral graphic organizer and we talked about the lytic and the lysogenic cycles and we noticed that the first and second step to each of these replication uh, cycles is gonna be the same. The virus has to attach. In this case, it's a bacteriophage, and so it's gonna be attaching to the bacteria. Then we have to insert the viral genome. The viral genome is inserted. Okay, we're gonna come and focus first on the lytic cycle. The smallest word is the fastest cycle. Small, short, over, done with. So first, we're gonna go ahead and inject the viral genome into the cell, and then the host machinery is going to create new viral parts. Now, it has to create both the viral genome and the viral proteins to build the capsid, to build the structure to sur surround the genome. So now that we've got all the parts, we're gonna see it put together. So we have viral assembly. Once they are created, they are released. They are released in two different ways. The cell could be overfilled with viruses and it could literally burst open. That kills the cell, but that releases a whole bunch of virus at one time. Now the other type is budding which we saw before as exocytosis. The virus is slowly released through the membrane and the viral membrane is surrounding the virus. So now it has an envelope. It has viral, or sorry, it has host membranes surrounding the virus so that next time it bumps into host, it's like, oh, I recognize you. That's host membrane. Well, come on in. Now, budding is slower, but that cell can live longer to produce more and more virus. So again, that's the lytic cycle. Small name, short cycle. Short name, short cycle. When we move over to the lysogenic cycle, we tend to use the idea that it lies in wait. So we do have viral entry, and we see that it's gonna be, the red line is going to be our viral genome. Well, our viral genome actually integrates into the host genome or the host DNA. So now it's a part of this long, big strand. The viral genome lies dormant and the host cell keeps replicating. Now it's going to split into two and then those split into two, and so on and so forth. At this point in time, the cell does its normal job. It's going about its normal business, not even realizing anything is different. It says every time it replicates itself, it also replicates the viral genome. Each new cell contains the virus. Okay, well that's not too scary as long as the cell does its job. But sometime later, in the future, it could be days, it could be weeks, months, or even years or decades. Sometime, some length of time, an environmental factor occurs. We're not exactly sure what it is. Something happens. It could have been you um, have gotten to, you've gotten so old that your immune system's not working so well anymore. It could be that you've been infected with something else. Your immune system is suppressed. We're not exactly sure what it is, but this viral genome will come out and start being used by the cell. And it will move into the lytic cycle to create more virus. And we'll see a flare up. Again, we tend to see this with the chicken pox. The first time we have the chicken pox, actually both of these happen. Some of the virus is used and duplicated and replicated and created, and we see that we get itchy patches on our skin like, like uh, mosquito bites. 
but some of the viral genome lies in wait and is dormant. And years and decades later, when it comes back out and starts becoming replicated again, it's not gonna be chicken pox anymore. We see this as shingles. The cells that they actually insert their DNA are the nerve cells. And so when it comes back up into the lysogenic stage, those nerve cells start creating virus and then pop, burst, lice. Well, when nerve cells lice, it hurts. And so shingles tends to give a rash um, that then is very, very painful because those nerve cells are the ones being impacted by the lysis. So viral replication, short word, short time period, long word, it lies in wait, long cycle. Again, I would go through this. This is what they tend to ask you about on the um, EOC, the end of course exam. So after we went through this guy, I had them take out their video notes from cells part one. We're not talking about the future. We're not talking about the present. We are talking about the past. And so we took out our video notes and I gave them the graphic organizer and we started talking about different scientists who helped us move from spontaneous generation into there are small living things among us. So if I zoom in, we're gonna look at one chunk at a time. We first started talking about Robert Hooke. And yes, he looked at cork that he named those little spots being the cell because it reminded him of the monastery cell. And we talked that he was one of the first to do a compound light microscope that has a lens up here and a lens down here. So you're talking about multiple lenses. And he was part of the High Society of London, the Royal Society of London, which were the wealthy scientists. And he created a book called Micrographia, Small Visible Pictures, that anybody could pick up and look at the pictures of things they couldn't see with the naked eye. Well, the scientists back then tended to be wealthy because they had time on their hands. If you were in the working class, you got up, you ate breakfast, you went to your work, you came home, you ate dinner, you took care of the family, and then you went to bed and you got up and did it again. The wealthy were the ones that had time not only to create the actual scientific machinery, but also had the time to investigate and explore so typically we saw wealthy influential people making scientific discoveries. But Anton von Leeuwenhoek was a little different. He was about y'all's age, maybe a little bit older, I wanna say maybe 16. And his dad had decided he was going to be, um, join the family business of cloth merchants. So his family had to learn how to grind lenses make lenses so that they could check out the cloth that they were purchasing to make sure it was high quality. Well, Anton von Leeuwenhoek got very, very good at making lenses. And he made single lens uh, microscopes to look at things. And he saw pond water and teeth scrapings. Inside the pond water, he saw things moving around, which we of course know now as bacteria and protists. But at that point, no one had ever seen that before. And it was like, whoa. And so he convinced his, his neighbors, his towns, and he, he let them look through the microscope and see him for himself. But the Royal Society of London, when he wrote to the, a letter to them, didn't believe him. He wasn't well known. And so they thought he had been drinking and had basically written him off as, as someone who was drunk. Well, he luckily got a hold of Robert Hook, who was passing nearby, and he got Robert Hook to come and look at his animacules. Robert Hook then wrote a letter to the Royal Society of London and said, no, 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 no. Anton von Leeuwenhoek is correct. We do see these moving little animacules, these things that he has named, and we should look into them. 
Then we went on to talk about Robert Brown. Robert Brown was another scientist of the day, and he named the nucleus. He saw the center. There was this black dot in the center of almost every single cell, and nucleus meaning the center mass. So you have Robert Brown and the nucleus. Then we get to Spallanzani. This was the last one that we talked about today and his poor, sad story. Spallanzani, it's just fun to say. And he tried to disprove spontaneous generation, that living things came from nothing. You put a broom in the corner, it cre people thought it created mice because that's what always happened. You had hay out in the barn, it created mice. You had meat out on the, out on the stair step or in the kitchen, it would eventually create flies. He was like, no, 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 no. Living things come from living things. And he tried to disprove this spontaneous generation. He boiled broth, which of course would kill all the microbes and things living inside of it. In this experiment, he left one open and he sealed one. He then, time passed, and then he looked at each. The one that was open had microbes and he could explain that the air, microbes in the air, were able to come inside and mix with that broth. And so we saw the microbes, but the sealed one, he broke it open and he found that it was still sterile. Nothing had grown in it. There were no bacteria, no protists, trying to disprove spontaneous generation. Well, unfortunately he was laughed at as a scientist because at that point in time, people didn't believe him. He was one of the first to start this, these experiments and they didn't believe him for a very interesting reason. They claimed, how could you? I can't believe you killed all these little animalcules because you deprived them of oxygen. Yes, the people believed that animalcules had to have oxygen to live. And so Spallanzani, of course, didn't find anything in the sterile broth because he deprived them of oxygen. Well, so that's a start. That's one of the starting experiments to disproving spontaneous generation. And that's where we ended today. We'll come back tomorrow and look at some more experiments that led to what we now know as pasteurization.